The human organism is a product of over 3 billion years of evolution. It is unique in all of its complexities and superbly adapted to its environment. Yet, like the machines that we have created, it wears out. Whether it's from disease or just natural aging, one or more of our organs will one day fail and lead us to our demise. But don't worry, this talk isn't about death or doom. But rather, it's about empowering ourselves to sustain life in spite of the limitations of our organs. About seven years ago, such an incident happened to my family when my father was in need of a dire liver transplant. For centuries, the idea of replenishing the human body has been at the forefront of the medical discipline. Today, even the most lethal organ failures could be treated with an organ transplant. But for our family, obtaining the replacement organ and undergoing such a process was a tumultuous job, not because of all the things that we should do. In fact, it was all the things that we couldn't do to affect the situation. All we could do was to wait. Economics is a study of how people, under the conditions of scarcity, make choices of allocation. Today, capitalism is a system of economics that dictate how resources are allocated in most developed countries. Since it thrives under continued economic growth, a capitalistic society allocates its resources to the highest bidder over those who lack the necessary capital to be competitive, even if the latter has a greater need. For most goods and services, this inequity is justified in the name of economic growth and free commerce. But what if the allocation of resource has so much at stake that one's life depended on it? Such is the case with human organs. The requirement of a living or a freshly deceased donor makes organs scarce, and their potential to save a patient from certain organ failure makes them invaluable. These two qualities make human organs the perfect commodity to extract economic growth, yet South Korea and most of the developed world do not. In South Korea, the Korea Network of Organ Sharing, or also known as KONOS, is a government-run, not-for-profit organization that monopolizes all the legal organ supply and is responsible for allocating them. Let's look at systems used to determine who can get an organ and on what grounds government officials use to prioritize the lives of one citizen over another. If the system were to presume the lives of all of its citizens as equal, it would be perfectly equitable by definition. But that equity makes prioritization impossible because everyone is equal. Thus, a system must have a way to quantify and assign different values to its citizens for prioritization. Today, the driving metric of this algorithm is biology. Konos prioritizes organs allocation by gauging an organ's potential to extend a recipient's life. Though there are many ways to calculate this, the industry standard is the EPTS score, or the Estimated Post-Transplant Survival Score. Konos uses the EPTS score and other genetic factors such as blood type to determine how successful an organ transplant would be for a designated patient. According to the United States Health and Human Services, the EPTS score is calculated using the following formula. I know this is a very, very complicated formula, but let me break it down. Notice how the EPTS score takes into account the patient's year of dialysis, whether the patient had diabetes, and whether the patient had a prior solid organ transplant, and their age. The higher the patient scores on the EPTS benchmark, the higher the one is placed on the organ waiting list. The EPTS scores detachment from an individual's net worth makes this system 
more equitable than what would naturally arise within the inequities of capitalism. Some argue that this serves as a safeguard that protects the integrity of human life. However, the systems in use today to allocate and to, to allocate and successfully transplant organs are unable to keep up with demand. According to Won Hyun Cho, the director of the Korean Organ Donation Agency, there were 3,908 transplant operations conducted in South Korea in 2018. This accounted for just over 11% of the more than 30,000 patients on the organ waiting list. This means that a patient, most, the overwhelming majority of patients must wait more than a year to obtain an organ, which drastically decreases their chances of survival. There were three patients above my father on the waiting list. None of them survived. Witnessing this process seven years ago was taxing. Circumstances operated far beyond my control that seemed impossible to navigate through. I can only imagine how it would have felt if I was the one who needed a replacement liver. That got me wondering, would another system of allocation make organs more accessible for patients? Well, Korea could try what, Iran, you know, what the Iranian government tried. In 1988, the Iranian government allowed the free trade of non-related, meaning not related by family, uh, transplants of organs of kidneys by setting it a fixed price of 4,600 US dollars, which opened up a free yet heavily regulated market for them. The impacts of these policies were immediately noticeable as the number of solid kidney transplants almost doubled within the first year of this policy. Iranian government only allowed the commercial trade of kidneys, a non-essential organ that whose removal of one of the two does not pose an immediate threat. Rather, such a financial incentive system would work for essential organs like hearts and livers is a mystery. Surely, a policy like this that is implemented in South Korea can make organs more accessible for patients in South Korea. Even if it did, how inalienable would our rights to life that are protected by our constitutions be if such commercial trade of organs were allowed? The truth is, no system, at least that of allocation, is perfect. No system will be able to save all the patients, and no system will be perfectly equitable. In the grand scheme of things, the allocation of an organ will always be determined by what we prioritize. And no matter what we prioritize, some patients will always be left behind if supply is unable to keep up with demand. For me and my father, we are extremely lucky to have an healthy anonymous donor bestow his liver upon his untimely death. But not all patients experience such restored health and restored hope. These were only privileges that we were able to experience because we were lucky. No system would have saved the lives of the three people, the three patients who expired before our father, but a donation could have. And considering how our livers can regenerate up to 50% of its original math, that donation could have come from anyone healthy enough to afford the healing period, given that donor has a relatively uh, compatible genetics with the recipient. A gift like this could absolutely save someone's life. And we'll never understand the value of such donation until you or someone you love is put to that list. It doesn't actually have to be a liver or a kidney transplant. In fact, I'm not asking you to go out and donate your liver or kidneys. Even assuming that you're in perfect health condition, undergoing such a transplant procedure is a dangerous undertaking that not everyone is ready to take. And even a blood or a plasma donation could still change and increase someone's chances of survival. 
Assuming that you meet the basic medical criteria, you can donate your blood every 8 weeks and plasma every 2. If you aren't comfortable making such a donation, don't worry, because your organs will continue to exist even after your death. Should the day come that your organs no longer serve the primary function of sustaining, sustaining your life, they'll continue to exist and one or more of them could be a precious gift to another recipient. For those who reside in South Korea, I implore you to go to konos.gov and register yourself as an organ donor. If you're tuning in from the United States, most states have a simple checkbox that you can verify to make an anatomical gift. And even if such circumstances do not apply to your situation, identifying yourself as a potential organ donor could be as easy as setting up the medical ID in your iPhone. There are always solutions for those who seek them. I'm asking you to seek them. Gestures like this can help pivot the world into a more altruistic, healthy, and empathetic place. Life is a precious gift, not just for you or me, but for others, if you so choose. Thank you.